Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mitch Taco Bell. I'm your host with Tall Tales with Taco. I got to tell you, uh, it's going to be a great time tonight. We're having a little bit of a difficulty on the technical side, getting Frank on. But we will soon get Frank Whiteley on board the show. But I did want to say something. I got the chance to meet a podcast icon legend. Uh, Jocko Wilnick, and uh, I didn't I didn't get to meet Echo Charles, but I was walking through the airport in Charlotte, and there was Jocko, and the nicest guy in the world, absolutely the nicest guy. I went right up, stuck my hand out, and he smiled, talked to me, and um, uh, I did tell him I've got a very small podcast, but of course, uh, as a peon compared to the millions of followers that that guy has. I really, really enjoy his stuff. So, Jocko, if you happen to catch a glimpse of this, glimpse of my show, just know that I really try to be like you. I love Joe, and I love your show as well. Uh, tonight, what we're going to talk about is PSD. Now, in the Marine Corps, we have PSDs all the time. That's what I'm most familiar with when we have a high-ranking officer, general officer, uh, heck, even my lowly uh, butt in Afghanistan was assigned a PSD when I went out into the field to go do um, checks on the Afghan National Police, some of their little um, uh, kind of Fort Apache, the Bronx. I mean, when you go out there, they have HESCOs built up on the high ground. They've uh, built a little compound for the Army guys, the advisors, the folks that will uh, liaison with them. And then the Afghans are on the other side. So when I would go out to these places, usually had a sergeant or somebody assigned to me uh, to go take care of me. And as a matter of fact, I think I was in country maybe two weeks when I went to Jalalabad. And I am out in the middle of nowhere. There's a police station. We go in for a meeting, uh, sure, with uh, some of the local uh, elders who, um, I mean, the one guy leans over and says, uh, that, that guy's Taliban. You know, so it was kind of that eerie weird deal um and come out of the meeting don't think anything of it i see a young boy he, kid could have been more than uh, eight years old running down yelling at a donkey trying to get the donkey to stop and you see this donkey running down the road and it had um like saddlebags on it uh, big cloth saddlebags and so i ran out in you know behind the protection of the hesco i went out into the street and stopped the donkey and the kid came running up and he was smiling, happy, thank you. And I gave the, the reins back to the, from the donkey to the kid. And my sergeant comes out and goes, sir, if you ever do something that stupid again, I'll shoot you myself. And I'm like, sergeant? He goes, they'd sacrifice that kid in a heartbeat to keep you from, you know, being here, you know, to take you out. Um, look at the side. They've got a, uh, the side of the thing had a propane tank and and it dawned on me later i was like you're exactly right they could have put explosives in the bottom of the propane uh on that thing and, and remote controlled i would have died suicide by donkey suicide born by donkey uh would have been pretty bad but you know what that's what psds uh do personal security detachments or bodyguards uh, they try to take care of their um, charges just as best they can and if you guys remember the movie that came out with Kevin Costner, The Bodyguard, I thought that was a pretty good depiction of probably what the life is like. And then I got to laugh. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, The Bodyguards, uh, The Hitman's Bodyguard, uh, cracks me up. And probably one of the funniest uh, films going. And, well, it kind of talks about being a bodyguard for, you know, hired uh, people. Uh, without further ado, I am going to bring Frank Whiteley on. Frank, how are you? Can you hear me? Right. Well, I know that I've got Frank there. Let's see Frank Top Gun. If he can move back over into the picture. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I was All trying right. to I was trying to use um can you hear me? Yeah, I got you five by five. I think everybody can hear you. Okay, great. I was trying to, to figure out which is the best uh, um, 
Where am I? Ah, just put yourself right in the middle of it, that. We just want to see you. Hey. Hi. I uh, lost okay, you. So Volume. Hey, what? Once again. Okay. You know, we can hear you. We just I'm can't worried see that you. I'm not going to have enough streaming. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, Frank. Um, you can turn the video off if you want. Okay. Let me tap the just... computer. I just want to talk to you. We'll, we'll go with talking. How about that? Don't worry about the video. Can you hear me? All right. While well, Frank is trying to work on that, um, we'll get back to him in just a second. Some of the things that Frank started, uh, he started back in the 90s, uh, probably early 90s after the academy. And these are the things that I'm really interested in because working with some of the A-list stars in Hollywood, uh, some of the situations that they run into and see, it's going to be a little bit different. Bear with me here. Okay, Frank, can you hear me? <laughs> oh, this is frustrating, but that's okay. Let me tell you what Frank did. Frank and his beautiful wife, Carrie, and Michael uh, Sheriff over in Scotland. I know you guys, if you follow my show, have heard me talk about Michael over there. They have the Top Gun groups in, in Facebook. And there are a ton of people on that thing. Probably over 100,000 members on the Top Gun group. Well, Frank really did... 99% of the work um, putting together this entire deal that we had uh, out in San Diego last May, in May, uh, this past month. And we had a lot of the actual um, pilots who flew in the original Top Gun. We had Bill Badalato, um come out, and it was just a fantastic deal. And both he and his wife, Carrie, just poured sweat and blood into this production and kind of made it like almost a, um, a Hollywood movie production. Let's see if we got Frank back. Frank, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I got you five by five. Don't move. You're good. I'm not going to move. Wow. Okay, so three devices. We finally got one to work. That's the, the joy of living out in the upper part of the mountains of San Diego, um, we we just don't have internet. Yeah, I get it. I get it. No problem. Hey, Kerry, go ahead and pop in there so everybody can see how he married up in life. Yes, my God, you are beautiful. You're like my wife, Thank man. You. I sit there and go, we married way up in life. We we pay we pay a lot of money to be married to beautiful women like that. that. I'm going to see if I can get an earpiece for him. Okay. All right. You can hear me now. I can hear you. Hold okay, on. I like that commercial. Put on the other ear. <laughs> okay. Okay. I hey, saw, listen. I didn't hear anything. You can hear me talking. I can hear you talking. It's not working. All right. Okay. Just, we'll just do it this way. Yeah. Just do it that way. That's perfect. All right. Okay. I, I want to go back. How 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 do you become a person, a PSD, a personal security guy or an officer? Uh, what, what do you call it? You yeah, call it personal, personal protection, uh, PSD. Um, I started this. Oh, God, in 80, 84. I just got out of college. There was a career fair and, um, you know, a lot of the uh, different agencies were there. I thought DSS sounded really good because you get to protect people and travel the world. And shortly after that, um, I was at a restaurant having dinner and two guys were talking about uh, bodyguarding this guy, uh, uh, Tom Cruise. And I'm, 
interested because uh, I was kind of interested in, in their conversation. And, and it worked out very well where they paid me an awful lot of money each week to uh, watch Tom Cruise. And, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So and, you just have to be in a restaurant and you hear these guys talking about, hey, we got to hire a bodyguard for Tom Cruise. Did you even know who Tom Cruise was? I did not. And I, I just I got caught on on, you know, we do whatever it takes to, uh, uh, you know, make this guy comfortable on the set. And that the, the amount of money that they offered per week was more than than most people were making per month back then. And right. it got my attention really quick. And, uh, you know, in, in a sense, it was like I got to go to Top Gun. So. Well, all right. So, so the movie, you got to go to the movie, but now how did you, you got into law enforcement first? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I came from, um, uh, it's a whole other story for, for that one, a, a different podcast, but, um, my family is, was from law enforcement. And so, um, being around it, uh, wanting to do that type of thing. My father uh, got out of the Navy and taught uh, the Sheriff's Department how to shoot and move uh, for their SWAT team, their newly formed SWAT team. And uh, so I got to, to uh, uh, see how, how that pertained in a, a career of what I wanted to do. And so I, I figured that personal protection detail would be a fun thing to, to do you get to travel. Um, I definitely wanted to go abroad and not stay in the States. And that's why the state department looked like a more uh, favorable choice than um, state, you know, going to law enforcement in California or whatnot. Right. Well, I actually got a picture of your dad. We there he is. have an entire conversation about growing up as mill brats. And oh, yes. happy father's day. Godspeed to your dad. But that, uh, we could definitely have I, – I know that we discussed some of our adventures growing up on base, and you and I, man, we're two peas in a pod going out hanging out with Navy SEALs and watching them skin rabbits and stupid stuff like that when I was a uh -huh. kid. Yes. Um, dad, um, so I grew up in the Boy Scouts and my father, you know, grew up in, in uh, he was six or seven during World War II and, uh, you know, backside of, of Utah. And you had to, you know, hunt deer and, and rabbit uh, on a weekly basis to feed your family. And so growing up, we, we still ate rabbit when everybody else went to the supermarket to get their their uh, their meat. But it was a little different. Um uh, dad sent me to um, a, uh, a three-day uh, Boy Scout camp at, at Camp Pendleton with the Marines. And I paired up with the oldest Marine that was there, figuring that we were going to eat well. And we actually did. I mean, this guy caught rattlesnake, and um, they fried it in a tin cap that came off of a, a, a Dodge pickup truck. And <laughs> it, it was a very interesting childhood. That's for sure. Yeah. Good times. So yeah. how old were you? How old were you when you started on Top Gun? 24. Um, about the age of everybody else, about 24 years old. And that, that's your first assignment. So did you talk to anybody about how the hell, how, how do I do this? Cause that's your first assignment. Yeah, that's my first job. And so I, I paid attention to when uh, Tom's um, agent, Nicole, came down and um, uh, I, I paid attention to every time that somebody important was talking and it kind of networked into the next film. And uh, uh, within that summer, I had lined up uh, several different jobs and went on to do um, uh we did, um, I think it was Flight of the Intruder right after that, yeah. and then um, The Hunt for Red October, and it quite possibly be, because um, they were all released in 86, so Heartbreak Ridge, I'm not sure which of the sequence, I think it was uh, Flight of the Intruder first, then Hunt for Red October, and then Heartbreak Ridge, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I word got out really quick with William Morris. Um, it was first was a uh, creative artist, and then um, William Morris kind of um, uh, picked up my name and said, "Hey, can you work here? Can you work on this uh, film?" 
that was kind of fun um, working on Heartbreak Ridge. Again, it was here in San Diego, and uh, the tides had turned from L.A. Uh, it was very expensive to film there. Uh, the film commission had pretty well much burned out most of the studios, and the neighborhoods were were uh, congested with cars and and films uh, crews kind of invading their their neighborhoods. So San Diego was a new place to come, and there was a lot filmed down here for many years. And Heartbreak Ridge uh, with um, Clint Eastwood was one of those, and that was a fun film to work because um, I get to call my father and say, "Hey, you want to meet at Pendleton for lunch?" Right. Uh, by the way, Clint Eastwood's going to be there. Who? Yeah. So now who? Well, all right. That's another story. Let's go back. Tom Cruise. Here's a shot of Tom. Yep. Um, yeah. God, that guy looks like a kid there. I mean, he was. He was young. But uh, yes. Yeah, he looks like a kid. So, what? Any strange things ever happen when you're with Tom on Top Gun? Oh, any, strange. Any, any, any? I mean, any weird fans that came up that you had to go out there and tackle or, or talk to him, just be very nice and say, look, uh, please don't bother him, blah, blah, blah. Um, not that I, that comes to mind at the moment. Um, uh, uh, Tom was, was very focused on the film. Um, he, he, would talk to uh, pilots galore, learn how they talked and walked. But um, he really, really was there to start and launch his career as well. And uh, keeping him from doing dangerous things, um, that was enough. Uh, everybody wanted to go skydiving on a, uh, on a Sunday when we were, were – uh, were off and so the first few Sundays was SAR school and and uh, training for getting ready to fly in the F-14 and right. then we had a few Sundays that were off and we got the bright idea of, of um, looking in uh, advertisement to go skydiving for like $59 uh, down in Otay Mesa and I just happened to have one of the old big huge brick uh, cell phones that uh, was new um, technology then. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, they were huge. And uh, I remember it ringing and uh, Mr. Bill was on the phone and he was, uh, what are you guys doing? Uh, we're sightseeing. Where are you guys? We're over, you know, Southern part of San Diego. What are you, what are you doing? And I couldn't quite say that, that, you know, he, we were going to go skydiving because I kind of figured it was against the rules, but no one had actually explained out all of the rules at that time. <laughs> and, um, it's like, don't let him jump out of the plane. And there he is, he's out of the plane and it's like, go get him. O okay. And so I went to go get him as well. Um, I, I learned early on that you have to protect actors from uh, doing things that are fun, but also can close down a film very quickly and uh, let, allowing uh, actors to do their own stunts. It was kind of unheard of at that time. Um, there was pretty well much a risk management team that would figure out how dangerous this is and, you know, are we going to allow it? Would it make a, uh, uh, the film more realistic if you allow the actor to do the stunt versus the stunt man. And that was all kind of a new evolution at that time to uh, allow the actors to do their stunts. And now, um, you know, Tom is, is, is uh, very uh, athletic and, and does all of his stunts. Um, well, what about the motorcycle? Realistic. I remember you talking about oh, the motorcycle. Yes, that's a great he story. Didn't so how, he didn't know how to drive a motorcycle, right? At, at the very beginning, no. Uh, the, uh, so the script is being read at Paramount, and that guy that's on the uh, right side of the uh, 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 Tom on the, the second motorcycle, that's Randy Peters. And uh, we, Randy had taught um, uh, Tom the basics of riding around Paramount Studios. So it was a very short lesson. And then about two months later, three months later, um, the motorcycles arrive at Miramar um, one morning. And uh, I remember that very well. We were uh, 
we were on the back side of, of the hangar and the motorcycles show up. Everybody's excited about them because they're pretty cool bikes. And Tom jumps on the one and says, get on, Frank. And, and so I was going to jump on the other one and we were going to go for a ride. He goes, no, uh, right behind me. And so I can get some practice in. What I did not know uh, at that point is is that uh, he, he hadn't ridden motorcycles very much. In fact, uh, this is the <laughs> second time that he had ridden a motorcycle. And uh, we got about 10 feet before we fell over. And uh, so some with of the... You as, with you as ballast on the back. Correct. And so uh, it was more to... Uh, work out the uh, the kinks, as you can say, on learning how to ride a motorcycle with someone behind you. Um, so it was uh, it was interesting because we crashed that bike. And uh, so some of the uh, scenes could only be seen on the left side of the bike. And oh, both bikes right. were, were identical, except for the uh, the stickers were different on uh, both of them. And then one had a crash fender on the front. <laughs> I bet they loved you for that because then they had to go back in and, and fix that sucker. What is this? Yeah, there's this uh, John Simpkin and Anthony. Edwards. Uh, yes, I don't. I can't see who the other guy is behind him. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was. Uh, at you crashing on the motorcycle. Yes, they probably are. They're going <laughs> like, oh, fire that guy right away. Um, <laughs> what about what about this? Uh, who was that with Tom? That's one of the SAR instructors. And um, so uh, they had uh, uh, taught everybody the basic ejection out of the F-14s, um, the effects of going through a, a G-force. And um, I think that guy's name was Mike or something. Um, but he, he uh, became pretty close with uh, um, Tom on Sundays teaching the basic water um, rescue, how you feel in a parachute in the water. And later um, he actually was one of the, the divers that jumped in after um, the parachute dragged Tom uh, underneath the water. And um, we can get to that story if you want now. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. So um, the, the goose death scene um, we filmed off the coast of Point Loma and it was on a big giant tugboat called the war cloud. And uh, they had a mannequin of goose and um, they carefully rehearsed all this thought out um, in their mind um, before we went out onto the ocean. And we're just a couple miles off the coast of Point Loma. Uh, basically, if you look at Viper's house and go straight out two miles, that's where we filmed it. And um, just enough away from the fishing boats so right. that you wouldn't see that in the background. But they laid out the, um, the parachute and they had the mannequin in his arms and the crushed helmets there. And um, the the waves are, are rolling and Tom's head bobs and bobs underneath the water occasionally. And all of a sudden he just bobbed and he went down and we're waiting for him to come back up. And yeah. he doesn't come back up. But uh, the SAR divers and the, and the, the Navy divers that were on this um, detail, uh, they were in the water within about 45 seconds and they had a back up um, just over a minute. And that was a long time for someone to hold their breath. And I remember um, the comments is that, yeah, it was pretty uh, um, good thing almost he didn't smoke. Close. Yeah. Almost came close to uh, smoking Tom Cruise drowning him. Huh? Yes. So at that time we decided that uh, we were going to detach the parachute and go to plan B and uh, just let the parachute dangle around and then they'll hold them. Yeah, but, you know, that would still get you. Those, uh, the cords get wrapped up in your legs and, you know, that 550 that, cord. I remember doing the water survival stuff. That that can that can get you pretty quick. It Dang did. It. And um, we, although the, the Navy divers were prepared for it, obviously, um, it took everybody by surprise. And right. um, it, it, it literally was a good 45 seconds before they realized that uh, um, Tom was going down. And that's deep. It's not like you're in a studio. Wow. No. 
And it was great because afterwards, there's a picture of him on the end of the dock, I think, or the end of the boat that I, I sent you. I'm not sure. Um, he's waterlogged, and you can see he's hurting a little bit, but he was right back to work within 10, 15 minutes and back in the water, ready to do it again. Jeez. So you go from Top Gun, which here's a great shot of the guys out there doing some stuff. Yep, that's a lot of camera 80s. gear. Yeah, I love the 80s look. Yes. Oh god. <laughs> I mean I mean Top Gun, what what a I mean we've had that discussion about what a great movie and good time for you guys when you're filming it. Um as a matter of fact, I saw another picture that made me made me laugh. First of all, you do realize that back then you you kind of looked like Kevin Klein. You got you got a little bit of the Kevin Klein look to you right there. You see Kevin Klein? I see that with the mustache. Or you could probably pull off your try in the Magnum PI. I haven't figured out which one which one you, you were trying for when you were back in the 80s, man. Oh, everybody had a mustache that was cool. And I think I'm probably sure that Tom Selleck sent that uh, uh, that trend off because, you know, he was cool. He was a PI in Hawaii, drove yeah. a red car. And, and uh, yeah, that I had that mustache for a good 25 yeah, you years. New York, you got New York Yankees with Buddy. And you got that, that stash on, or this one. I love this. You are the background guy back there. Yep. With the glasses right at the bottom, and you've got that mustache. Look pretty serious. Yeah, um, Tony Scott talked me into uh, being on camera um, uh, during Top Gun uh, during the the bar singing song. And I was literally four people behind John Simpkin because everybody knew John and uh, uh, John was the go to guy. And so I felt pretty comfortable uh, uh, being behind him. And uh, after all the footage and, and uh, uh was done the editing was done i was on the cutting room floor and then i realized you know what it's just it i get a little nervous and so uh i felt it was better just to be in the background and and so there was a lot of movies that the directors always say hey why don't you be the extra over here or be in the background on this one and i always declined and i i a little regret over that because on Top Gun, there's a makeup guy named Scott Edo, and that's the first movie that I worked with Scott. Scott, um, he does hair and makeup for uh, the big stars, um, Sylvester Stallone stuff. But he has a cameo in every movie that he's worked on, and so he gets residuals. And that was something they didn't teach me about when you um, when you're negotiating your your uh, your deal memo uh, residuals. So, and yeah, I looked this all hey, over your again. Focus is, your focus is supposed to be protecting your pr principal, right? Correct. So you don't have time and you can you do that. that. You can do that very well by being five feet from him on camera. So it's just it was one of those things where I decided that early on I feel more comfortable being off camera than I do on. Now I got to ask: Were you uh, normally armed when you were doing this? Always. Stuff? Yes. Always. I've carried a gun now for oh, 35 years, 37 years. Um, it, it, uh, it's pretty good. Yes. They uh, pay you a lot of money. You get to go to different places and you get to carry a gun. Well, you know, that's that that was your first experience. And with no no kidding, a super A-list star. Let's go to Buddy. How did you meet Patrick Swayze? And what was your first film? My first film with Patrick was... Tall Tales, unbelievable. Um, uh, he had a, a Disney movie called Tall Tales, The Unbelievable uh, Adventures of Pecos Bill. And it was a Disney movie. And again, uh, Bill Badalotta was uh, producing that one and called up and said, hey, uh, you want to watch Patrick Swayze? And I'm going like, sure. I don't know who Patrick is. And um, so I get there a week ahead of time to set up the hotel and everything. And um, I'm asking Mr. Bill who uh, Patrick is. And he goes, you know, the dirty dancing guy. And that didn't ring a bell. And he goes, roadhouse guy. I'm going like, yeah, that rings a bell. I know the roadhouse guy. Okay. So uh, I pick him up at a small little airport uh, outside of Rifle, um, 
uh, Colorado. And he introduced himself as Buddy Swayze. And I misunderstood what he was saying. And I said, well, we're not buddies yet, but um, uh, <laughs> I like you. I'm pretty sure we'll be friends sooner or later. And uh, he goes, no, that's what they call me, Buddy. Uh, I'm little Buddy. And his father was Big Buddy. And uh, he had this uh, this uh, energy that he um, uh, produced that was just incredible. Made everybody feel um, just uh, very euphoric. It, 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 his his energy was could fill a room. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I happen to have a good friend of mine lives right down the road here, Marshall Teague. And I'm going to bring him on because I figured the two of you can feed off of each other and talk hey, about your time. Hey, Marshall, you got your mic muted. You just have to push your button to unmute your mic. Thought I did. Oh, there we go. Hey, how I'm are so you, man? Glad. <laughs> hey, Frank, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's I'm so glad I'm you. not the only one having problems with their mic or camera. Technology, God, you know. It's, it's not right me friend, a memo. You know, it's just not my friend. Well, folks, yeah. uh, if you don't recognize Marshall right off the bat with his COVID beard, um, Marshall Marshall is a film star that starred alongside Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse and the famous scene at the end where he got his throat ripped out. And, uh, <laughs> and Marshall also was in uh, Armageddon. Yes, and, he was. And then and he called me up and he goes, you know, Marshall come over and he helped turn wrenches on the on the ferret on the armored scout car. And he uh, calls me up one day, and goes, Hey, Taco, you need to call this lady. Here's her number. She's a casting director for this movie I'm in called Amerigeddon. And and that was a blast. So I got to hang out with Marshall. He yeah. got me a little small part. I got shot. I see myself on the big screen get shot. Hey, we both awesome. got shot, brother. Yeah. Well, you got I tell you this watching you get shot was so realistic when the squibs went off. And all of a sudden, you drop at my feet. The director's going, drop, drop, you're dead. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Cut. Oh, I'm sorry, Marshall. Everybody's got a first that up. day, man. Oh, that was funny. Frank, I tell good, you, um, I, I knew Patrick um, from 91 until his death in uh, 09. Um, and when, when it really hit the fan on different things in Patrick's life, he was like, get the phone book out, the Rolodex, and call Marshall. Marshall will take care of this. <laughs> and he had the – over the years of, of – uh, different fights. Um, yeah, we were actually in a bar fight in Brussels, uh, um, Belgium area. And uh, after we walked out of this thing, he's like, God, I wish I had Marshall here. And I'm going like, what is this with Marshall? This big, huge thing Frank. over the you year. Got Frank there. What's the problem? <laughs> Yes. And so he finally let it out of the bag. He goes, Marshall was the only guy out of all the fight scenes he's done in all the movies he's ever been in. Uh, Marshall was the only guy that said, hey, let's let's make it realistic. Let's let's like, you know, hit each other, not put each other in the hospital. But he almost did on Roadhouse, he said. He said, you guys really let the the punches go. And he really respected that. And that's the 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 thing about Marshall was um, whenever uh, the stuff hit the fan, it was let's call Marshall. And I finally figured out or he finally explained why. He was a wonderful man, wasn't he, Frank? Wasn't it? Yes. He, yeah. he just we were just talking about that. And, um, you know, it, it, Roadhouse was definitely at the height of his career and, and he was feeling good about himself and uh, about his life. And it was moving in a great direction for him. Yeah. yeah well, you guys yeah. were definitely blessed to have a relationship with him. I miss him Truly. every day, Frank. Same here. Uh, I, miss but, I miss him every did, single day. You get those four o'clock in the morning phone calls? Not anymore, and I miss them because we used to start it. Used to start at four and went till seven. Yes, <laughs> yeah. The you, the phone ring would would ring anywhere between two o'clock and four o'clock in the morning, and you know the only person that calls you at that time would be Patrick. And it's like so you answer the phone because you want to hear what he has to say, but, uh, uh, yeah, that guy started his day around midnight when he wasn't working. 
And, yeah. and um, then, yeah, he called friends and, and he was just used to that lifestyle uh, from, from being a world. dancer. He was all yep. over the world. He'd call you. Never and, failed. God, that's great. Oh, yeah. And what did, Yeah, I think we even call, called you when we were in Paris. Well, you called me in Paris. About 2000. Got, got me somehow from uh, India. I don't know how. From he India, did that. yeah. He called me from India at one time. Oh, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. 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 Didn't surprise now, Marshall, me. You know, I was asleep and my wife said, you know, the phone rang and she just said, it's Buddy. So, <laughs> you know, it's Buddy. Go get the phone. <laughs> yep. So when you guys were on the set of Roadhouse, did you act as his PSD when you guys went out? Did you guys? Did I did not. I didn't work no, on no, Roadhouse. No, I'm, that I'm was before no, I'm talking about Marshall. Did you act as his uh, personal security detachment when you guys went out drinking or anything? You know, it's it's interesting you say that. I, I, I never was his bodyguard. I mean, I have bodyguarded. Frank knows that. But with me, with he and I, it was just a friendship. And, you know, did I walk, watch his six? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I did. But, you know, I wasn't his bodyguard, you know, and people thought I was. But, you know, it was kind of like, no, I'm, I'm his I'm his friend. I will kick your ass if you hurt him, but no, I'm I'm just a friend. I love yeah. it, man. That is some great. What, what's your favorite? You know? What's your what's your what's your dearly? I mean, we're talking about Patrick Swayze, who is just a phenomenal man from all accounts. Um, what's your favorite story of what he did for somebody? What is what is my yeah. favorite story? Yeah, favorite story about Patrick Swayze about something that he did for for someone. You know, like just helping him out or. Or meeting someone. Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, you know, times we spent together. I mean, I had times when he would call and ask me if I would come over. You know, uh, helping him out. Buddy was very handy. You got to understand. Frank will tell you this. Oh, Frank's Buddy got a was story very about handy. that. Yeah. Right, Frank? Yeah. That guy. Um, so people ask me what type of person Patrick was. And I sum it up with this short story about what type of man he was. So this is four weeks after he broke both of his legs on uh, Letters from a Killer. And he was, was uh, yeah, I was on a horse. Yeah, and yeah. The director, we had done this, rehearsed it like four or five times, and they're on a bareback on horses, and um, the horse is supposed to run through the trees and around to the side of the camera, of B camera. And um, the the very last time that the horse did this, um, the horse spooked on the camera for some reason and threw him into the oak tree. And you could actually hear the, uh, the legs break, the femurs break. And so... Um, with, I'll, let me expand on this story because it's really great. So, uh, the hell or the, the ranch that we were filming on, um, we don't have cell service at all. And the old man that owned it had a, an old Korean war helicopter and he actually flew to, um, took one of the cell phones, flew to a place to get on the phone and then called the sheriff and the ambulance and they finally showed up. So he's feeling pretty good. He's in the ER, um, in Sacramento and, um, uh, he's all doped up on on morphine and all sorts of good drugs. Now, he had just purchased this ranch in New Mexico. And all this movie is, all he's talking about is, I need to make enough money to buy a used bulldozer so I could uh, uh, make roads for my, my property so I can go back and explore and put a pad out for my barn because he wants to build this himself. He's very into building and, and, and grading. So, um, you know, he wants to buy a used bulldozer and grade the road himself. So that's the plan. So he's on morphine and they're talking about putting him in, into surgery. They're trying to get the surgeons together to go do this, this surgery um, where they're going to uh, hollow out his leg and put a, a, a titanium rod down the femur and then screw it back together. And then he can get be up and walking in, in a couple of weeks. So uh, we're at his place in uh, Sunland and uh, my well at my house, um, it broke. And so the old man that uh, comes out to fix it, if you, if you down here, he charges a couple hundred bucks if you listen to him. But uh, if he has to show up on his own, then it can be a thousand bucks because he doesn't like to 
to work alone. So I just asked Buddy, can I go down for the day? You don't have any doctor's appointment. Nothing is pending. Um, I'll be back in the morning. And he goes, screw that. Load up the Suburban. Get the tools. Um, what do we need? And I'm going like, the guy's a, a well man. He'll, he'll have all the tools. We just have to listen to him. And he goes, well, bring some tools anyhow, because we might need them. <laughs> and so he's always prepared. He's always like, bring, bring extra stuff. And we'll, we'll I'll tell you some stories about bringing extra stuff. But um, uh, yeah, we went down to uh, my place in San Diego and, and um, the old guy, you know, oh yeah, I watched it in Roadhouse. It was pretty good. Um, but <laughs> other than that, uh, that's the type of guy he was. He was um, just one of those guys that, that uh, if you needed a helping hand, he was there to help you. And it didn't matter if he was in pain or, or um, you know, just on a regular day of not feeling any pain. Um, you know, he he always had this um, this attitude that um, if you need help, I'm there to help you. Yeah, and that's true. Um, he was very generous with his time. He was very generous with his um, uh, money. Um, you know, if, if you were hurting and he knew it, he'd take care of you. And he never, never expected. I mean, he loaned out tons of money, but he never asked for anybody um, to, uh, pay, to back. pay it back. Never. never. Right. He paid back. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was raised um, uh by a, a true Texan, a, a cowboy, and uh, I think that's where he got a lot of his um, his love from. His mother gave him discipline and structure, and the ability or the the mindset that you do something and you do it right. And if you didn't do it right, keep doing it till you do it right. Yeah. Well, you you got that was when you filmed for the show, right? That's that? on his birthday. Um, yeah, this is this is what I'm filming um, for one of his documentaries. Uh, I'm getting to share some some real true stories about Patrick and right. and um, but uh, yeah, the the first shot was um, he got his uh, star on on the Hollywood Boulevard um, actually on his birthday in August of. There he is. And he felt that it was a really big honor to uh, have that all set up as a birthday present for him. And, uh, yeah, he invited his entire family uh, to come out and, and enjoy that day with him. Wow. And so I was honored to, to um, uh, be part of that celebration with him. Yeah. What about this? That's – we were uh, doing um, – a uh, point break, even though I didn't work on that movie um, with him, they were doing a publicity junket down there in Australia. So we went down to Sydney and Melbourne for a couple weeks. And that's in this hotel that we were at. And it was, it was they, they gave me the junior suite next to his massive suite. So I had like the kids room. It was bigger yeah. than my entire house at the time. And <laughs> it, it was just really huge. And we kept going in my room and we we're like, why are you always in my room? Because it was more comfortable than the giant suite that he had that, you know, the, the park Hyatt had given him. And so, yeah, it was a, a fun time down there. I love, I love this shot. There's, it's kind of like catching you in the background. I know yeah. like the military mill aides when they're behind the president, they don't want to be, I guess if they get caught on film, everybody makes fun of them. They have to pay a fine. So, you know, if the yeah. Washington Post is shooting pictures and you're getting out of the president gets out of the helicopter, mill aides kind of out there walking. If they catch them in the line of sight, you get fined. But I, <laughs> I love it. You're right there. Yeah, we, Once, we were walking up to some red carpet event. And so um, – uh, I'm either in front to the side or just to the rear of them. And over the years, you catch a few pictures and, and people will send them to me. And someone, someone actually sent that one to me and goes, is that you? Yeah, that, that was me. Oh, that is funny as all get out. Marshall, is Lindy hanging around the corner there? Oh, she's back in the back. You know, she's uh, back in the back working on technical what's, stuff that I can't Once do. again, all, all three of us, we married way above our pay grades because oh. I'm – so, I'm telling you, I am. You, you two both have incredible. This is that's Carrie. 
there's uh, Frank's wife right there. And uh, and I don't have a picture of Lindy. Okay. I know I do somewhere, but I can't pull it up like that. But uh, if I had a producer, I could be telling them, hey, man, go get 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 Marshall's stuff. Oh, uh, shoot. Uh, I mean, I, I I actually, you know, uh, just I'm last minute. I hope you don't mind, Frank. Because no, I well. said you're going to be here and I just I told to him hello. I told I told Marshall I wanted to, uh, if he could come by for a drive by because in October, you know, when we all get together, at least you guys have met, you know, uh, via computer. But you guys have met and able to say hello. So come October, we all get together. It's going to be a blast. And I've got oh, Teresa it will. Up. And it's, we, and we shared a little bit of the stories about Patrick on the phone. And there's there's a whole bunch that can't be shared on the phone that I'm dying <laughs> to tell you in person. <laughs> Over a couple beers or margaritas. Oh, yeah. We'll get yeah, some we'll Mexican. Toast a good friend. We got to drink Miller Light. <laughs> Sounds good. No problem. Well, Marshall, I appreciate you stopping by, brother, and you. Uh, I hope Thank you. Thank you for having me. Frank, it was good to see you, Taco. Always a pleasure to see you. Yeah, man, it's and, been a uh, while. So now we got to get you over. I got a new, I got the bigger fox. You need to come over. I need some help uh, turning wrenches. We'll work on it. God bless right, you. Go. Hey, God bless you, man. Have a great one. I'll see you. you too. See Bye -bye. you, Marshall. Bye. Hooray. Thank you, Frank. Bye. Man, that was awesome. So, uh, yeah, I sent him an email, and I just said, hey, man, if you if you have a chance, do me a favor, do a drive by. And he he thought literally yeah. you were at my house. And he goes, Oh, I won't stop by your house and announce. I'm like, No, 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 man, via computer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's what that link's for. You know, we are old school. This is, yes. Um, I've actually done more Zoom meetings this week than I have in my entire life. So I'm, I'm starting right. to become pretty good at that. Um, with you know work things uh people are zooming now and so i i got it installed on my phone and i thought my laptop had uh, we'll we'll work on that but well, yeah we got to get we got to get you better internet up there in the mountains but i do absolutely love your place um i'll tell a story on myself you had me drive mr bill so so as kurt and i are driving mr Badalato up the hill you know we're going up there and i'm like oh yeah i got a quarter tank of gas we'll be good we're in your suv and then I go in there and fire that thing up and it's on empty. And I'm going, I didn't think about the grade. The grade going uphill was like this. So all the gas was in the back. And then once we leveled out at your house, now we're on empty. We co we coasted probably five miles on empty with the light on it. I'm going, please don't die on me. Just make it till that first exit where we can get off to get gas. Oh my God, that was funny. You are up in the mountains, man. You must be 5,000 foot elevation or something. Just about. We're at 48. And so enough to get snow and last for a few days. And it's it's nice um, occasionally, but it's, um, yeah, I enjoy it. Um, it's about uh, 23 minutes out uh, up in the mountain from my office and yeah. 40, 40 minutes from downtown San Diego. So um, it's about like traffic time. That's not bad. Now, everybody can't see the photo. So if you're listening to the podcast uh, you have to come back and watch it because i did post a lot of photos tell me about this that's not your horse is it that's my horse that's tucson and we were downtown san diego uh doing a cowboy uh parade and so a few of my friends we we all ride horses together we're part of this old man group with a uh, charity group uh called the outlaws and uh -huh. Uh, it was a particularly hot day for St. Patrick's Day, and, and so um, Tucson's been mowing that lawn behind him there for a couple hours, and I need water, and so I figured he can drink out of the um, the fountain there just as easy as anybody else. So I just kept right. the button down for him, and he went at it. Oh, that's hilarious! Now, who is this guy? Who is that? That's Stuffy Rhodes from ZZ Top. No way. Yeah. What were you yeah. what were you doing on that job? Um, so we were at Santa Carita Studios and I was um uh with Billy Bob Thornton on uh waking up in Reno with Patrick and Billy Bob and Charlize. And um Billy Bob has an array of friends, and one of the guys that showed up was 
ZZ Top. And we're like, oh, I got to meet him. And so we hung out and I, I actually, we brought him over to our trailer and took him away from Billy Bob um, for a couple hours and, and entertained him or he actually entertained us with stories. But uh, yeah, he's an incredible guy. A lot so of on, we, Were you on a set like that with Billy Bob? I mean, those are big name actors, right? So Billy Bob, Patrick, uh, Charlize, do, does each person have their own little bodyguard? Um, some do. Yeah. Um, Billy Bob had um, uh, a, a younger kid than me. He was about, I think I was about 35 then or something. And this kid was probably 28 and um, he was really good. Um, uh, I, I, I appreciated his, his background and his skill. Did you? Uh, Charlize did not have a bodyguard. She had her mother. She had her mom. She beat him over yeah. the head with a purse. Did you get yeah. to do co Color of Money as well? I worked on it for just a little bit and then moved on because they had a, a director issue. And um, so I got to meet Paul Newman. And um, then they had a, a, a shutdown for a couple months. And I moved on to a different film. Oh, did you? Oh, wow. Yeah. What is What is this one right here? That is Black Dog. Uh, that's in um, uh, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. Is that Patrick Swayze's brother? That's Patrick. Uh, that's Sean Swayze. And uh -huh. then the other guy is Scott Edo, the makeup artist I was telling you about. Oh, yeah. They got all yeah. the parts. So we yeah. got to work. We got to work on that with you. You got to start getting, you know, getting some more parts here. Get your bit parts. Get those residual <laughs> checks rolling. <laughs> yeah. oh man well who else who besides uh patrick who was probably the most what was the most fun job that you had out there i i enjoyed um i enjoyed heartbreak ridge heartbreak ridge was a lot of fun uh clint eastwood was um a lot of fun to work with um or work for um again he's just like a an older tom cruise he was very focused um you know he had been around the block um a lot by then and knew exactly um what he wanted and what he expected and um it was um it First of all, everybody was like in awe um, working on the film with him and the chance, the opportunity to work on on this particular film. And um, it was about the Marine Corps and, and uh, yeah. uh, Camp Pendleton had given us uh, an older part of the base to work on and pretty much run of the whole base, kind of like Top Gun. Here's what you want. Take it. Go with it. Do, and, do you remember? Do you remember the Swede? The really big guy, the yes. NFL football player. Yes. Yeah, that's that Pete. Was huge arms. Yeah, Pete. Pete was on my show a while back. Uh, I went out to LA and had a layover and called him up, and he came out and met me for breakfast. Um, yeah, he's in Santa Monica. So if you ever oh, wow. get a chance down Santa Monica, let me know. I'll get you two hooked up. He's at the gym almost every day out there. I would believe so. God, yeah. I mean, he was he's huge then. Oh, he's 60 and he's still, you know, the body of a 30 year old, I mean, oh. work, workout wise, just inspirational guy. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are people I was on, um, uh, got to work with Sylvester Stallone on, on Copland. And, um, that was a turning point for him, for his career, uh, because he wanted to be, a uh, a prove that he wasn't always an action uh, hero he could do uh yeah. drama parts as well and that was where he's just a regular guy and he was just pile driving in donuts and you know what everybody else eats for for breakfast he's like looking and he's like you guys actually eat this for breakfast yeah it's, <laughs> it's like called a donut and he's like but it's like filled with carbs and sugar yeah and it gets you through the day and uh so you just, about 15 minutes till you get the next one in your pie hole Right. But it was interesting where, you know, he actually, um, uh, you know, got off of a, of a regular diet, uh, a work, uh, a, a muscle diet and yeah. just got to eat normal food, oh, pizza and stuff like this. And so it was like watching a five year old, you know, playing uh, you know, with the uh, water hose for the first time. You, know, you get to see this grown man enjoy all of the foods that we take for granted. 
uh, when you have to work out. Well, hey, let me ask you this. Go back. I, I talked to my monologue about um, Kevin Costner's movie, The Bodyguard. As a real guy, well, how do you rate some of these movies? I mean, looking back on The Bodyguard, how did you, one to 10 realism? Or, what, what do you think? Aside from sleeping um, with the uh, yeah, the so um, the the um, the teams that are out there now are really really good teams. Um, there's a lot of talent that came um, from Afghan, that came from Iraq, that um, uh, uh, embassy guards. I mean, just there's a lot of skill that's out there, and so now um, people that that have um, uh, I hate to say it, when you have a lot of money and you're a high profile target, um, you don't want a bar type um, bouncer being your uh, your bodyguard. You want real talent, real skill. And so the bodyguard was was um, it was pretty good film and it shows a, a, a true life situation. And um, we have this, uh, it's a, a low risk, medium risk, high risk um, where you have uh, a fan that has a fantasy. And when they're thinking about something that's played over and over in their mind, and when that fantasy becomes reality and it's not what you thought about consistently, it kind of snaps something in your mind and, um, it, 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 um, it changes, uh, your perception. So you become dangerous to, um, that actor, um, in the, in my day in the 90s in the 80s um there wasn't a stalker unit at lapd if you had a problem you hired security and they watched your house they followed you around you got a bodyguard there wasn't a lot of people doing it um back then uh, yeah. now it, it's it's um it's pretty interesting because there's an internet group and they're hesitant about posting uh, when they need to augment their team. Um, they're hesitant about posting who you're working for because, um, you know, they're worried about, you know, poaching your clients. Um, I was worried a little bit about having people poach my clients, but if I was available and not working on a different job, I didn't, uh, you know, it, oh, well, I wasn't able to, you know, uh, work for you on this phone. And what would you do? Would you get up with the L.A. Uh, or the task force that was around to be able to say, hey, we've gotten these letters or we have this situation with this particular person? I mean, where would you get your intel from to be able to make um, the decision? Yeah, I made contacts with LAPD and um, you usually talk to a desk sergeant and they uh, uh, hook you up with um, a, a detective that would tell you, okay, so these are the different things. It all kind of changed with um, the Pam uh, uh, Dauber, um, yeah, the Pam Dauber situation because you used to be able to just show a PI license, get a, uh, a DMV report and find out where people lived. It was very easy just to go in and get that information from the post yeah. office. And it kind of changed those rules. Um, so uh, I'm kind of getting off topic. Um, no, 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 back no. in. All right. So, so years ago, this probably maybe seven or eight years ago, Gary Sinise was, he would come to our, skyball function that we had every uh october and we're we're literally at the at the stage and the guy in charge comes up and says hey taco i need you to escort gary sinise to the bathroom and i'm like really oh okay you know i'm in my evening dress uniform and i go all right let's go gary let's <laughs> we have to cut across the entire we're in an airplane hangar giant american airlines airplane hangar and we walked to the back of the uh hangar and there's the men's room and he pulls me aside and he says all right here's what we're going to do um we're going to walk in i'm going to turn my back so nobody can see me i need you to go to the very farthest stall make sure it's empty make sure the one next to it's empty and then when you turn around give me a thumbs up uh i'll walk down i'll occupy the farthest stall and you'll make sure nobody comes past the one next to it and i'm like Roger that, sir. So he does his deal and he goes to the bathroom and comes out and washes his hand real quick. And of course, everybody wants to shake his head. He's like, hey, hey, you know, here, I'll give you an elbow. My hand's wet. The nicest guy in the world. Take take a picture. But he goes, uh, 
you wouldn't believe how many people will stand there and I can't take a pee in the stall because they'll pull the camera out and do a selfie and go, look, I'm with Gary Sinise. And he's standing there. You know, he goes, oh, I got to, that's what I've got to do. It's my life. It sucks. But at that time yeah. they had a female, they had a woman who was running around telling everybody he was, she was Mrs. Sinise and that she yeah. was Gary's wife and she was married to him. And I mean, like we're you know, loco and they'd gotten word that she had, uh, social media she had posted she was hidden to texas to do this so everybody was on alert and it, it was just bizarre to uh, be on the lookout for this you know showed us pictures of what this woman looked like everybody look out for this person so i can right. i could see i had an actor that had a problem like that uh back in the the mid 90s where um uh he's a very uh a-list actor every, Everybody knows who he is. Um, he had this problem um, where a guy actually went and got a driver's license, changed his name uh, to the actor's name, tried to open up a bank account. Um, and he got up on the radar with um, LAPD and he was getting ready to go do a movie up in Spokane. And the producers uh, uh, were aware of this problem from his, his agents. And we talked to LAPD and they said, hey, uh, you know, send a security detail. And when we got up to Spokane, we talked to uh, um, uh, the Spokane Police Department about it as well. And, you know, what does this guy look like? He looks exactly like our guy. Um, you know, very, very similar in, in the same uh, facial features and kind of sort of the same. And, and uh, eventually he was uh, arrested and he did go to a mental institution. But, um, yeah, people, um, they... Uh, they cross the line and um, uh, get a little bit uh, weird with their things. Um, okay. With my actors, it was um, I worked on Alien Resurrection, and uh, my actress brought out her uh, uh, her daughter, which was about eight at the time, and they live in New York, and they wanted to uh, uh, go to Disneyland and. She was worried about the the child being kidnapped and held because of of who she was, and uh, you know, not for a huge sum of money. Most of it's just for a hundred thousand, something you can get out of the bank without questions asked. And um, so it it was um, it was very interesting uh, listening to her concerns and then addressing them, especially at Disneyland, and um, how, you know how to deal with that. Um, did you have any, actors, did you have any issues in Disneyland? Um, no, um, that that went really well. Um, they had front of line privileges for actors back then. I don't know what they do now, but um, I know that um, with like Patrick, um, people in bars um, when they get a little drunk, um, they really want to see if he can fight, and um, and he could. He's he's a martial yeah. artist. Yes, he is very good. And um, he studied Taekwondo quite a bit. And um, then over the years, uh, in different uh, fight sequences, you can mix in some mixed martial art moves and stuff like that. And, and he really enjoyed doing that. But it was like um, uh, you get his brother involved, um, you know, at the bar as well. And they're both two Texan guys. And they're like, we're going to settle this here. I'm like, if we can't mess it up, here's the problem. You have to protect your actor and his face because right. if you've got a black eye, you can't fix that on camera. Right. And so when you have someone that's very stubborn, um, it, it's hard to, to get them out of trouble. And um, no, Patrick was that type of guy. Uh, that if you told him, no, you can't do this, he was very stubborn and proved that you could do it. Oh, my God. That makes the job just a little bit more interesting, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, hey, I saw somebody, Alan Brooks, just signed in late. Sorry, it was working. Uh, Glenn hey, Williams Alan. Is a, you, know, you know Glenn Williams' dad, uh, Don Williams, from the Midway. He hangs out with Paul, Paul Ward. Oh, okay. And hey. uh, and you and you actually met him up when we were upstairs in the map room by the bridge. If you oh remember. yes, yes. And, uh, Rosemary wants to say hi, Frank and Marshall. Hi, Rosemary. Best guys. Yeah, here we go. 
of course, John, I'm wearing my, uh, I'm wearing my, uh, let me get rid of this thing. I'm get, I'm wearing my shirt from uh, England. So we had the uh, uh, Queen's own yeomanry shirt on. So that's what he was talking about. Anyway, uh, oh, Regina. Yeah. Hi, Regina. <laughs> yeah, I think Regina said, I think he just threw his computer. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was a rough start. I think we did pretty well. So yeah. We got it back going. And you know what? I can't thank you enough for uh, for coming out here and joining me. Um, I'm actually really excited that Marshall got to meet you. I look forward to October. Uh, good news. Michael just got his passport, so we're all going to be able to get together. Uh, yes. And we'll be able to see Kurt and his wife, you and your wife, my wife, uh, Marshall, or not uh, Marshall and his wife. will all hook up uh, Michael and his, I think he's bringing his wife over. So anyway, we're all going to get together and we'll hear some more uh, tales. I can tell you guys, I understand why Frank is a little bit hesitant. Some of the stories are very colorful and would make for a fine print in a book but probably not for uh, anything over a PG uh, or under a PG level. But one day, one day, I think Frank's going to write a book one day when he's about 70 years old, he'll be able to tell, tell some of the stories. There you go. Hey, let me ask you this. What was your favorite thing you stole off of top gun? Uh, oh, on. God. Um, so my, my best production donation, um, yes. it was probably the Maverick sunglasses. Um, I did have the Viper helmet for, uh, quite some time and, uh, don't know exactly what happened to that, but I think my, my most favorite thing that I have right now is the Maverick sunglasses. Yeah, man. Hey, you, you need to finance a new piece of property. I'm sure somebody would put that on eBay. Somebody would pay somebody for that son of a gun. I did try yeah. those on. They're very small. Yes. He's got a he's got a very small head. Well, yeah. I've got, I'm an aviator. I got a big head, so that's probably <laughs> the uh, the issue right there. But hey, Frank, I can't wait till we see you in October. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And anybody that's out there listening, do me a favor, hit the subscribe, like, uh, set the reminders on Facebook because you never know who I'm going to get. And uh, always stand by for exciting guests and fun crew. And anybody that knows Jocko, tell him it was a pleasure meeting him in the Charlotte airport today. You missed that. You were getting your computer ready. Um, let me show you this. Do you know who uh, Jocko is? Jocko Wilnick. He's a uh, Navy SEAL. No. And and he has a um, he has a podcast. Oh. Uh, the dude's an animal. Uh, the thing he's. He was enlisted, became an officer. He is just huge builder, bodybuilder. Um, smartest guy, you know, when you're listening to him on his podcast, he'll read a passage from a book and then he'll start talking to that person. Um, very intense. Let's put it that way. He has a great show. So if you ever on your drive to San Diego, pull up his podcast on YouTube they are phenomenal. So you can enjoy that. Cool. Give you something to do. Anyway, yeah. Frank, I will see you in October. Thank you, brother. Uh, give Carrie a hug for me and tell her thanks for helping set everything up. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Is there, is, hey, is there anything that you wanted to share? Uh, saved round last uh, charity or anything that you promote? Anything that nope. you wanted to share? No, just uh, uh, have a great weekend. Hey, oh, what about any details for uh, next year's Top Gun days? Oh, wow. Um, we're still working on the Top Gun book. So we have 1,400 pictures. We've now dropped down to um, about uh, 300. So we're going to get the book out. But what I hear, we have five pilots from uh, the old movie, and we got five pilots from the new movie. Mm -hmm. And so we want to tail them together in a big forum and put them out for um, questions and answers. and. Uh, um, hopefully for Top Gun Days 2023. All right. Well, we've got that going for us. You know what? I, I totally forgot to ask about the porta potty as a set trailer for Swayze. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? 
Okay, so Patrick had a sense of humor, and I found out that that uh, playing jokes on him could, was very exciting. Um, he's pretty pretty gullible. Um, this particular film, he was like, "Hey, I, I think I'm gaining a little weight, so just feed me salads." So real quick, um, I was just feeding him salads, and uh, then I I would. Um, uh, have the wardrobe tighten up his pants just a little <laughs> bit every day. And then he's like, God, I, I got to quit eating. So I'm not going to eat anything. Just feed me coffee. And, and so then um, I let the seamstress, they would expand the, or let the pants out a little bit. And then he caught on when I made him shorter. I made his pants a little, <laughs> little smaller and then he kind of figured that one out. But um, we had gotten back from location and we were going to a movie ranch to, to do this movie Tall Tales at a, a Western ranch, the Disney Western, Western ranch in Santa Clarita. And you, you go down the, the uh, trailer land and there's a whole bunch of uh, fifth wheels all parked in a row. And you look for your actor's fifth wheel, which has their, character name on the on the door and we drove down this thing twice we backed up drove down it again he kept where's my trailer and i'm going like it's got to be here it came back from colorado it has to, everybody else is here where's yours so we back up again and then i stop right between these two trailers there's a small gap and there's a porta potty there and i i had andy gump a, a porta potty system put a, uh, a a nice clean porta potty there with his name on the door and i go <laughs> This, this must be yours. I, I don't understand. And, you know, get your stuff, get out of the truck. I'll, I'll go park the car and figure this thing out. Without a beat, he just grabs his, his bag of, of, of stuff for the day and goes and sits inside the porta potty and he's doing his business for a good 15 minutes. I come in and go like, hey, well, it's, it's, you know, where's your trailer? And he's like, hey, I'm busy right now. Um, just give me a couple minutes and I'll come out and then. But yeah, he had a great sense of humor. Um, uh, we were playing jokes all the time, and uh, he didn't mess a beat on it. And he had a a, a good uh, um, good joke over just about anything we could pull off. What was the New Orleans pack story? Oh, so uh, he had um, a waste pack um, back in the eighties and nineties. It was fashionable to have a uh, a, yeah, a little, fanny pack. Fanny pack, and, right? Yeah, and I got him a concealed weapons permit out of um, the sheriff's department, and um, he got a, a gun for his birthday. I got him a little Walther PPK, and nice. um, so he's, he was happy with that. And we had pulled into New Orleans um, for a couple weeks of filming, and we're, we're there ahead of time, so we get to go out for dinner. And so we, we took this green and white cab to this restaurant for dinner and he left his back or his fanny pack on the back seat with his he just got his pilot's license um we got his dmv card or his driver's license renewed he had a gun and about two thousand dollars cash sitting inside this wallet all i'm concerned about is getting the firearm because i don't want it to be you know in somebody's hand and then probably have to stand in line with him at the DMV. But um, he's only concerned about his, his uh, pilot's license because that's a really tough thing to go back and get uh, renewed from the, uh, the FAA. So he was concerned about that. We're calling this cell phone constantly. The cab drivers got the, the uh, fanny pack up on the front seat and he's doing his job. He's uh, taking people to and from the airport, making money to support his family. And um, eventually after a couple hundred, uh, so we're panicking. We, we think that the it's gone. It's been a couple hours. We're really going to, um, you know, this is this is a problem. So I called the the movie cop that uh, we hired for extra security, and he gets a couple of black and whites to come out and help us find the the green and white cab. And every green that's all we have is a green and white cab. We don't know what right. number or, or anything. And so we're I'm in the front seat of a cop car, and every green and white cab we see. Uh, he would reach over and turn on the lights and sirens and pull it over and, and see if this is the driver. And I was like, no, that's not the guy. And eventually after like 10 or 15, I'm playing with the lights and siren and the cops looking at me. He's like, Hey, 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 don't, don't touch the toys. It's only me. I'm going like, come on. 
And so eventually the guy actually answered, the driver answered the phone and he said that it wasn't his um, property to answer the phone. What if it was a personal phone call and he was going to turn the, um, the uh, fanny pack into the, uh, the dispatch, the driver's dispatch at the end of a shift. And right. Um, you know, I, I was talking to him, kind of feeling him up to see if he's kind of telling the truth and stuff. And, and he's um, a, a recent immigrant from another country, and he's just trying to make some money. He's got a kid on the way. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I believe him. And I go, Do you know what's inside this thing? And he goes, no, it's none of my business. And so I open it up and, and, and show him, um, here's this envelope. And this envelope, oh, wow. You sure you didn't look in this thing? And he goes, no, look, it's sealed. And I said, well, here, here is this. Uh, I, I want to reward you for your honesty. And I gave him the envelope with all the cash in it. And um, wow. he, yeah, it brought tears to his eyes because it's literally more money than he would make in a couple months. And, and it really helped him out in a time of need. And, you know, I went back and told Patrick that I gave away his, his per diem. And he goes, I don't care. Did it help the guy out? And I said, yeah, yeah the nice. guy's got tears in his eyes. And, uh, you know, this is his hard struck story about his, his uh, life and trying to, you know, make it better means in America. And right. he goes, good. So, uh, yeah, he, he, Patrick was, it was amazing. Do you have time for one more? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so uh, Brussels, I, I like the story about Brussels. In about 2000, he's playing um, uh, uh, a knight, uh, a king in um, George and the Dragon. And so he's um, on this adventure with Piper Perabu and, and um, uh, some other actor. Um, and, and we're filming in this lake in Brussels. And to get there, it was these little tiny windy roads that just basically is um, eight feet wide. And you mm -hmm. have to go through town after town after town on these little tiny roads to get to where we were filming. And we're hungry. It's at the end of the day. He had been in the uh, in the lake and it's wintertime and they give him a wetsuit and you put your clothes over it. And uh, he'd been in this lake all day long. So he's pretty waterlogged. And we were driving through, our driver was driving us down through outside of Brussels, and I pass a big, huge plate glass window with the Dirty Dancing logo on the front really? of the window. Yeah. yeah. What are the odds of driving through Belgium, through Brussels, and yeah. seeing Dirty Dancing, let alone on the window now all week long when we were in paris um i paid the local radio station to pay um she's like the wind um <laughs> paid that guy a couple hundred euros play it all day long i don't care how much it costs just do it and so every time uh -huh. we turn on the radio station um you would hear in french and then the guy would break and say patrick swayze she's like the wind and then it goes to the song and he finally <laughs> caught on that i had actually paid the radio station to to do that but um, we had passed this uh, this big, huge plate glass window, and it turned yeah. out to be a a, a, a restaurant. And uh, we're, we're like hungry, so we decide, what are the odds of this dirty dancing restaurant? Let's go. So we walk in, and Patrick's got the longer hair extensions for his uh, character, and a ball cap on, but his voice you you know Patrick's voice, and right. so. Um, the uh the it's a uh, old man and old woman's um restaurant they were in their 50s and um uh she's behind the counter cooking the food he's the server there's only two people in there us and right. we walk in we sit down and he comes over and gives us the the menu and he says here's your food what would you like and I'm looking around at the pictures on the walls and there's pictures of dirty dancing all over this thing. And yeah. it takes this guy about 30 seconds with Patrick saying he just wants like a cheeseburger or something. Yeah. The guy realized now the woman, the, the wife had recognized that that's Patrick's voice and she's been over the stove all day long. Evidently she beelines it behind the counter up the staircase to the apartment above. She was gone for a good 10 minutes and um, uh, she comes back down. 
Yep. She had fixed her, her makeup, um, put on a nice dress, and she <laughs> took her menus away from us. And she goes, are you who I think you are? And he says, yes, ma'am. I think I am who you think I am. And <laughs> What a great uh, story. Yeah. And she goes, nothing on this menu I'm making for you. She turned around and um, opened up her kitchen and she made us this great home cooked meal that we will never forget. And she sat down and never asked for a picture or, or anything. She just wanted to share a nice night. We learned that um, 20 years before they were dating and their date night, their first date was to go see the movie Dirty Dancing. And it had just opened over there. And they went to go see it. And they were so, um, you know, they, they were moved by the movie. And obviously, he had some game and they got married. And um, then later, they decided to open this restaurant called Dirty Dancing. And what are the odds of Patrick actually driving through your town? And so, so did he stop. did he go did he go autograph anything for him or do some yeah. photos? I'm sure he, did. Yeah. he had to. We said I, I called LA and they sent a whole care package. Um, but um, we signed some uh, personal stuff. I carry a bunch of stuff with them and uh, he yeah. signed a bunch of stuff, took some pictures, but uh, yeah, they made their uh, his fan page uh, newspaper at that time. So uh, that's so awesome. What a great story. And what about there was did I lose you? What's that? Oh no, I'm uh, sorry. Something, something about signing autographs way too late. Oh yeah, so, so he was um, big on that. He would do that, right? He was big on that. Um, we get cut at two o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and we don't, we're not working Saturday, and we're not working Sunday. So we kind of got like a three day weekend on this movie called Black Dog outside of Savannah, Georgia, and. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, just doing some sightseeing and seeing some stuff. And he said he was going to plan on sleeping all day Saturday. So I'm not committed to do anything until Sunday. So I'm figuring like, yeah, I'm going to enjoy driving around and seeing this place. And um, so two o'clock comes, open up the trailer door. There's like five people out there and they want to you know, take a picture and stuff. And he's like, sure, no problem. And five turned into about 30. <laughs> and before we knew it, um, it, it was getting dark outside and he's like, the whole town is coming out. And they basically did. There was a couple hundred people and they circled um, their cars, put all the headlights facing one direction. People brought food and uh, we ate off the hood of the car and we had, you know, uh, also bought like dinner from the entire community and we sat there wow. and told stories and and shared you know our life with um these people and later this lady came up and gave me her phone number and she said look we're not like starstruck fans but if you guys are here for um thanksgiving and you don't have a place to go um give me a call and i'll and you know come to my house and so thanksgiving came um we're like trying to decide whether we want to fly back to LA for, you know, two days or, or not. And we decided the last minute we weren't going to fly anywhere or my boss did. And so I, you know, that morning I'm going like, well, what are we going to do for Thanksgiving? And you go down to the restaurant and eat. And it's like, I'm calling this lady. And so I called her up and said, you got room for two. And she says, absolutely. And we drive to this lady's house and it was her family. And they yeah. all said, hi, Patrick, shook his hand. And it sat down. We said grace and it shared their life, their, their dinner. It was the best, best dinner ever. Um, oh, there was fried awesome. chicken, there was turkey, there was ham, everything. It was a good, good time. And that's, that's great that's, memories. You, yeah. What it was, so you, you started this job so that you could travel and see things and meet some neat people. You have probably stored more great memories than all of us will ever amass in a lifetime. That's some great stuff. I really love it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I've kept you for an hour and a half and uh, or hour and 25 minutes. Brother, I can't thank you enough. I will see you in October. If you just hang on for a few minutes, I'll sign off and end and, and this thing. Okay. Thank you. All right, man. Hold on a second.
Hey, folks, uh, hour and 25 minutes. Thank you so much if you uh, stayed for the entire time. I really do appreciate it. Uh, make sure you hit like, share, and subscribe. Go down there and uh, do the reminders because you never know who will be on Tall Tales with Taco. You guys have a great night. Adios, hasta luego. So, it is a chus, shechini, au revoir, domenicato gozaimas, tando shindi, kurasai, ciao, rivedici, tashikor, assalamu alaikum, mahala, dovigenia. Das, yeah, I always screw that up. Nasta Sorovia. Anyway, you guys have a good one. Thanks again for joining us. And we'll see you again soon. Uh, let's see, which one should I do? I should do the this one. Take care.